All right. Um, I think this is week six. And this week we're going over the problems of evil. Um, and so this is kind of a, this is the subject that has all the touchy subjects kind of rolled into one. So, um, it, you know, thankfully, uh, because of the, the holiday, there's fewer people watching. So there's fewer people to get mad at me. So that's good. Um, so anyway, so, so we're going to go over the, the various problems of evil. Um, so Bertrand Russell, he said, no one can believe in a good God if they've sat at the bedside of a dying child. And so this is kind of the, uh, the way that a lot of people approach the problem of evil and why it, why it creates a problem um, for belief in God. So um, in order to, to kind of start things off, I want to separate out two problems of evil and suffering. And these are very distinct problems, and I want to I want to clarify which one we're actually addressing. So first of all, there's the intellectual problem, and that is is the existence of evil and suffering compatible with the goodness of God? And that is an intellectual question. So the other problem of evil and suffering is an emotional problem, and that is how do we believe in God's goodness while we're suffering? Okay, and so. An answer to one will not help you out with the other one, at least not directly. And so um, in apologetics, what we do is we focus on the intellectual problem. But usually, oftentimes when someone's having a problem with evil, they're not having an intellectual problem. So I just want to be clear that if someone's having an emotional problem with evil and suffering, that's a legitimate problem, but that's not what we're addressing today. Um, if it, that is a pastoral care problem, not a uh, intellectual apologetics problem. So, um, you know, don't try to, um, you know, giving people intellectual answers when they're, when they're suffering is not always uh, the best thing. However, I will say that, um, you know, if you know the intellectual responses ahead of time, it can actually help you in your emotional issues of suffering. Okay, it doesn't help, like, if, if you're having an emotional issue of suffering, someone giving an, an intellectual answer is not the best thing for you. But if you know the intellectual reasons, it already, it does help you in times of suffering. Um, but in the moment, what people really need is compassion. So I just want to be really clear about that. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Chris and I have gone through a lot of suffering specifically in this in in the way birch and russell uh mentioned we've 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 lost two children uh to genetic diseases and so we've we've experienced a lot of suffering in our lives and uh and i will say that um you know again knowing knowing the truth about god's goodness is helpful but people making that as a point during that time is not helpful. So that's why that's one thing that's good about apologetics is that we're all here, um, you know, doing this while while we can think about it intellectually, and later when we go through suffering, we can understand it more reasonably. So um, there's several types of evil in the world, um, and so the first one we're going to cover is moral evil: people doing bad things. And so the question is: Does the existence of evil point towards or away from God? Okay, so the first question is, can you recognize evil in the world? And I think most people would say yes to that. They can recognize evil in the world. Well, if you can recognize evil, then that indicates that you know that there is good. You might not see it, but you know that there's that there. You know what good is. You know what it means to be good. Um, so if there's good things that you can't see, so you haven't experienced it, you just know it could be better that implies that there's a transcendent moral order that is not being lived up to. So if, if there is good that you have not experienced, but you can recognize that it should be there, that is pointing to a transcendent moral order. So, and as we noted last week, a transcendent moral order implies the existence of God. And so you can refer to last week's lesson uh, to understand why that is. So, um, 
even though evil doesn't come from God, uh, the fact that we can recognize evil in the world helps us to, um, it, it, the fact that we can recognize evil in the world points to the fact that there is a God. Okay, so God's not the source of evil. He's the reason we can identify evil for what it is. All right. So you might ask then, well, why is evil even a possibility? Why did why did God create a world where there where there's the possibility of evil? Why didn't he create something that was just only the only possibility was paradise? Okay, why why is evil a possibility? Well, think if you think about it closely, you'll recognize some things. So at, ask yourself these things. First of all, would you rather be a robot? Or would you rather be able to make your own choices? Okay, think about that. Second question, do you want to make a positive difference in the world? Do you want the world to be better because you were in it? Okay, think about that for a little bit. Now, do you, it's kind of the same vein, do you desire to be beneficial to others? Okay, now, um, if you think about those really carefully, you can recognize that this actually does imply that evil has to be a possibility um, if we desire these things. So um, we might not want the actuality of evil, but we actually do want the possibility of evil. So for example, God could force us to be good, but he could do it by removing our choices. Okay, so that then we would be robots. Right? So if God forced us to be good, we would be robots. And that's what we, you know, if, if you agreed with me in those questions above, that's what we don't want. God could make every option good. So no matter what we did, it was good. But if he did that, it would make our choice meaningless because every outcome would be identical. So we couldn't actually make a difference in the world because everything that we did would come out the same. Okay, so that's the second question. If God gives us the capacity to be beneficial to others and the choice to do so, if we fail in that choice, that causes others to be less well off. In other words, it causes evil in the world. So simply, if we, have, if, if we want to have the possibility to make others better and we want to have choice about it, that means that that leaves open the possibility that we're going to make the uh, an incorrect choice and leave them less well off. Okay, and so literally just by the fact that we recognize that we want to be able to make choices, we want to do good for others, we want to be, we want our presence to be of benefit to others. That actually automatically means that there has to be a possibility for evil in the world. Um, cause people have to be able to make the other side of that choice. So, um, the, um, so just by the definition of those things that we want, we have to allow for the possibility of evil. So that's what, what, these are the things that God wanted for us. He wanted us to be free. He wanted us to be able to, to be beneficial to others, to do good, to make positive impacts. But in order to accomplish that, by necessity, there has to be allow for the possibility of evil. Um, so um, now you might say, well, could God, you know maybe maybe in our own self, God allows for us to be evil, but maybe God should shield us from the effects of immorality of others. Okay. Um, but think about that. If if we were shielded from effects, that would mean that. Um, other person's choices would not actually affect us. Okay, so that means that their choices wouldn't be. So let, let's say that, that if let's say if I pulled out a gun and shot you, um, instead of a bullet coming out, flowers would come out. Okay, well that would mean that pulling out a gun and shooting you would no longer be immoral. Okay, so having the moral choice uh, means that we have to be able to have effect on others. Um, and if we are unable to choose evil. It wouldn't mean that we're moral. It would mean that we were amoral. Um, the other thing is that, you know, for the world to make sense, there has to be a cause-effect relationship. So I have to be able to know the outcomes of what I do. And if God is simply arbitrarily swapping out outcomes for what we do, 
that would actually make the world not understandable. Um, it's not that God can't do miracles. He can, but if everything that happened was a miracle, if everything that happened was just uh, some random act of divine providence, we would have no ability to actually operate in the world. Um, so we, so God, for the most part, has to leave the cause-effect relationship in place. Um, and so, if again, if God shielded us from every bad action, the world would be irrational. So again, if 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 any like you know, if I throw a spear at you and becomes it, it becomes smiley faces or something like that, I wouldn't know which things I should or shouldn't be doing. Maybe I should be shooting you and throwing spears at you because God's going to turn it into something good, right? So um, it, it means that, that I have no control over what happens. It means that I have no ability to, to make things better, that I have no actual moral agency in the world. It means that everything, either way, is coming from God. And so it literally, it, it takes away from us both the ability to understand the world because we have no idea where these effects are coming from. It also removes our ability to make a difference in the world because if we're able to make a difference, then we're able to not make a difference and go the other way. So um, it would also make it very imp impersonal. So for example, if, um, if I try to do something to someone, whether, whether it be a good something or a bad something, and God simply replaced it with what God wanted me to have done, well, that wouldn't be very personal. That wouldn't be me. I wouldn't be interacting you with you. It would only be God interacting with you. And so the ability for us to have interpersonal relationships means that we have to be able to have interpersonal effects on each other. And so if God simply removed those effects that we had on each other, then we literally would not be directly uh, dealing with each other We'd only be kind of in virtual prisons uh, with God kind of marionetting what happens. So to preserve our status as moral agents, to keep the world rational, humans face consequences not only for their own evil actions, but those are of others. So as you can see, this is actually a logical requirement of the things that we do find to be good in the world. So that's moral evil, and, and I think a lot of people understand moral evil, um, you know, to, to understand that, that humans have moral agency. Um, that's not incredibly surprising. Some people have, have problems with it, and it's harder, again, the emotional problem of evil is, is oftentimes harder than the intellectual problem of evil. But then there's natural evil. There's the things that happen on the earth. Why is the earth out to get us, okay? Um, you know, we've got uh, hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes, you know, uh, you've you got snakes, we have um, all sorts of things where it just seems like the world's out to get us. Um, so where does this natural evil come from? Okay, so uh, the main source actually comes from Genesis. It actually has a moral source. Um, in Genesis 3, 17 through 18, um, God said to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you've eaten tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. So what God is doing is God's actually um, telling, telling Adam that he's actually cursed the earth itself. So the outcome of, of Adam's sin is that we live, not only are we fallen among each other, the actual place that we're living in is itself fallen. So we're living with the consequences of that curse. Okay, and so this is independent of what we happen to do. It's not, you know, it is not the case that every time Adam went out and had to face thorns and thistles, that he was doing individual sins and those thorns and thistles were consequences for his individual sins. Um, even if Adam were to have lived morally for the rest of his life, he would still have those same consequences. And likewise for us, the earth is cursed, and whether or not, it, completely independently of whether we live good or we live poorly, um, the earth is cursed, and we have to deal with that. So um, the other thing to keep in mind, though, is that judgment does happen. Um, there are cases where God does bring judgment to people. And we should keep in mind that not every disaster is a judgment, but we shouldn't we shouldn't also lull that into us thinking that judgments don't happen. 
So, you know, take, take for example, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? The Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. Okay, so um, God said, I'm going to go look and, and see, and if, that, if they're doing what, what people are saying they're doing, there's going to be judgment. And so we, we're all familiar with the, the judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, Jesus had this warning. It was very interesting. There were some present at that time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? No. And I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, it's actually a little unclear whether Jesus is specifically talking about these as judgments, or alternatively, which is another um, thing to keep in mind, is that um, natural, so as we mentioned earlier, natural evil isn't restricted just as a judgment for evildoers, but whether or not it's an actual punishment we can use it as a time to reflect on our own need for repentance. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do here. He's saying, look, um, you know, there, there are people who were killed and Pilate mixed their blood with the sacrifices. Um, you know, do you think that those people were, were more guilty than the other people around them? No, they weren't. You all need to repent. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that Pilate did that as judgment from God. Jesus is actually unclear about that. But he does say that we can use this as an opportunity to recognize our need for repentance. Um, there's actually, um, you know, the country of Haiti has been wrecked by kind of a, a, a natural disaster after natural disaster. Um, and so this has actually caused a number of people in Haiti to uh, start a movement of repentance. Now, I'm not, I, I have no idea if, these natural disasters are, are judgments from God or not. Um, I don't claim to know, but I do know that you can use them as an opportunity to reflect and repent. Um, you know, the, the fact that, you know, I think God sometimes, to some extent, the per point of the curse is to, to leave before our eyes reminders that we're fallen people, that there was a judgment, that, there, that, that we have a problem. And so that we can continually repent, not that this judgment is a, is a punishment for this sin, but just that we live in a fallen world, and it reminds us that we continually have this need to repent. So then, so that's, that's, that's moral evil, and that's natural evil. But then a lot of times people, when, on the question of, of evil and suffering, they'll point to the Old Testament because, you know, let's, let's face it, the Old Testament has some, some very interesting things to say that we're not always uh, real comfortable with. So, um, you know, so the question becomes, is the God of the Old Testament good? So, um, and a lot of, so a lot of the problems here, I think, come from the fact that we try to read the Old Testament as if it were written yesterday. And I think that's a bad approach. And so I just kind of, I, I brainstormed a few things that I think you should keep in mind when you're thinking about the Old Testament and things that are going on there. First of all is terminology, okay? Most people don't recognize the influence that terminology has over the way that we think about things. Um, so ancient and modern legal language is actually very, has very different categories for the way that they think about things. Um, and so sometimes you'll read ancient laws, and they're not always talking about exactly what you think they're talking about. And so having some background for, for what actually is happening is important, and recognizing that there, are, there really are very, very big differences between the way that people use, use terms in different times and periods. Um, another thing is assumptions. A lot of the assumptions that are going into the Old Testament are very different from the assumptions that are in modern society. Um, just as an example, um, you know, the Israelites, when they were given the law, were nomads. They literally had no land. Nobody at that time had a piece of land that was theirs. And so that's a very different society. It's a di very different way of living. And so we sometimes 
um, when we think about laws and rules, we just imagine us with our nice homes and uh, our our streets and our houses, and you know we have neighbors right next to us. And you know when you're when you're traveling in a community and you just kind of set down wherever you might be, that's a very different kind of living. Um, and so recognize that that might lead to a different kind of law. Another thing is technology. Um, many of our assumptions about how society should work are based on our current technological prowess and our current economic strength. And so if you imagine, well, what, what would life be like? How would, how would the law have to be different if we were all dirt poor? You know, are, are there things that we couldn't do if we were all dirt poor? Um, you know, what, what if we couldn't afford money for policemen? What if we couldn't afford money um, for all sorts of things that we might want to do? Um, so the law of Israel is, is intended to operate regardless of technologies or economic sophistication. So, um, so we just don't keep in mind that, you know, in our, in our cushy little uh, suburban houses, we're, we're in a very different place than the ancient Israelites. Um, then we have culture. And many of the things we take for granted are actually historical accidents. And so we can't just assume that the way that our way is the best and forget that a lot of the things we do, a lot of the ways that we do them, and even a lot of things that we think are moral or immoral actually are culturally conditioned. And so, um, you know, there are some things that are permanently moral and immoral, and there are some things that we just regard as moral and immoral based on cultural conditioning. So it's good to to really analyze and see which one you're talking about. Um, then there's, we, we need to recognize the purpose of the law. The Old Testament is there to teach the Israelites, and by extension us, the nature of God, good and evil, and prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. Okay? Um, it, it has a purpose, and the purpose is not to be the end all and be all. The purpose is to prepare the people for understanding the Messiah when the Messiah comes. And likewise, it was also provisional. Most people forget that the law was actually not intended to be a perfect law. Because um, even, so Jesus in Matthew 19, he's talking about divorce law. And he said, you know, God gave you this divorce law, not because it's the greatest thing. It's because you all were too stupid um, and too hard-hearted was the, was the terminology he used. But, but basically, you all were too dumb for us to, uh, you know, uh, to give you a, the real teaching about marriage and divorce. So we gave you this out because you're, you're, because you just weren't ready for it. And so the law was provisional. Um, it was a, it, it, it was an exercise in realism. It was bringing Israel more in line with God's righteousness. So we shouldn't view the ancient law as being a perfect epitome of what law might look like, but as a provisional way of bringing someone into uh, understanding righteousness. And then there's our limitations, because I think a lot of times we stand in judgment of ancient law, and we forget that our view of law is actually corrupt. It's a lot more limited than we realize. Using ourselves as the standard for what law should be like is kind of the reverse of how it should be. We should be looking um, you know, when, since we've recognized that morality transcends us, then we should not look to ourselves as being the source of the law or the judgment of the law. We should try to find what the standard is, and then we should submit ourselves to that standard. And we should finally, we should remember God's sovereignty. Um, our moral intuitions can help us understand the truth of God, and it can help us recognize uh, God's action and that, you know, our, a lot of our moral intuitions can bring us to God and bring us to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Um, but we, you know, in that, we also have to recognize that even though we're able to discern uh, that God was the right way, we also have to realize that, that we're more limited than God. And so we have to submit to the idea that God's wisdom and sovereignty can cause him to act in ways that we may not understand. So these are some things to to keep in mind um, when thinking about Old Testament and those laws. So the thing that people always ask about is slavery. They're like, well, you know, how did God allow slavery? Um, 
So this is an issue that combines uh, terminology issues and cultural issues. So, uh, so from a terminology standpoint, when we use the term slavery, what we usually mean is that thing we abolished in America in the 1800s. But that's not actually the biblical meaning. So, for example, in Exodus, it says, whoever steals a man and sells him, anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Okay? Um, so, this is the death penalty for what was happening in America. So, um, the Bible is basically more strict against American-type slavery than the abolitionists. It demands the death penalty for those who enslave. And it, if you read the verse, it says, anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. So even if, apparently, even if you purchased a slave that was, um, that was um, kidnapped, then uh, you would be put to death. So the type of slavery that we had in America in the 1800s was punishable by the death penalty uh, in the Old Testament. Okay. So if that's the case, then what, what was their slavery? So um, think about this for, what, for, for just a second. What is the longest jail term that you can recall being listed in the Old Testament? All right, think about that. What's the longest jail term? That you, and, and I'm talking about Old Testament law, not someone being thrown into jail. But if, if we think about the laws that were given, what's the... What's, what's the uh, longest jail term that's prescribed by the Mosaic law? Well, I'll tell you, there are no jail terms specified by Mosaic law because there was no jail. Slavery essentially took the place of the jails um, in Mosaic law. So, so biblical slavery was essentially jail, but it allowed you to actually participate in the life of the community. It's basically a time, it, so it was time limited, because if you were put into slavery, you got freed after, I, I believe it was seven years. Um, this was often carried out by family members, and there were often other ways to get out of slavery as well. Um, so this was not the case that... Um, that you know you you as as we mentioned earlier you couldn't just go take someone and throw them into slavery you had to have there had to be a reason that you were in slavery so um you, oftentimes this happened because uh you know if you if you uh stole someone's ox and you killed it and you ate the food and then you were convicted of this and you didn't have the money because most of the biblical um laws were based Based on, you know, if you if you do something against someone, you have to pay them back for it. Okay. And so if you didn't have the ability to pay them back, well, they put you in slavery as a repayment uh, for what you had done. And so anyway, so that so this is so so slavery was essentially acting like jail. Um, now there were also foreign slaves. Um, and they had fewer rights than the Israelites. But you should think about this. You know, in, in our society, we have Gitmo, you know, Guantanamo Bay, where we keep all of the foreign suspected terrorists. And so this is kind of, uh, that's kind of the same thing that, that foreign slaves were. They didn't, you know, if, if, if you imagine if we brought, were to bring the people that are, cur are currently in Gitmo and bring them into society and have them, you know, participate in life, we might not be as comfortable letting them out uh, to be free after seven years. And so that's kind of the same way that, that it happened there is that if you had uh, prisoners of war um, or spies or something like that, someone where you would be a foreigner that's being punished, um, you, would be, uh, you would be a slave and you'd be a slave probably for life. Um, so the other thing is that sl you know, slaves had rights. They actually had very specific rights, um, but slaveholders also had leniency regarding how they kept order. So if you think about like today in a jail, jail keepers, um, you know, if, if, if a jail keeper has to, um, you know, uh, hit, a, uh, hit a prisoner to get him to get into his jail cell, that's not something that we're going to drag him before the court and ask him to answer for. That's just something that he has the right 
to do in line with his duties. And so likewise, since slaves are essentially operating as, uh, as prisoners, uh, the slaveholder actually has similar uh, policing power uh, against them. However, the Bible is actually very clear that if you do any permanent material harm to a slave, that basically allows them to go free. So that, that means that their punishment has served, their, their debt has been paid, whatever it was that they did, if the slaveholder does permanent material harm to them, then, then that is considered sufficient for them to go free. Um, the killing of a slave is not tolerated. Now, it, it doesn't result in the death penalty like the killing of a non-slave. And I believe the reason for that is simply, you know, going back to police power. Um, you know, if you are in the process of, uh, you know, if, if a jailer uh, is trying to subdue uh, one of the prisoners and, uh, you know, if, if, if in doing so he does something that leads to his death, well, you know, the jailer would, you know, he would be punished. It would not be a murder because that's within his scope of duties, but he would probably be punished. He might be put on, you know, some sort of a, a probation or something like that. Um, but we, we wouldn't consider it a full-blown murder. And so that's kind of the same way that it happened in, in uh, the Mosaic law is that they didn't tolerate the killing of slaves. Uh, it did not specify a punishment um, it basically left it to uh, kind of a, a council to decide what the actual outcome would be. So I'm not arguing that this was a perfect setup, but neither is our modern prison system. Every system is going to wind up with a possibility of abuse. And so um, my, my main point is just to recognize that, you know, if you, so if you think about it, like if you're in a nomadic culture, where are you going to put the jails? How, if you're, if they're wandering in the desert for 40 years, moving around every so often, where are they going to construct jails? How are they going to keep them there? So instead, they had a system of slavery that allowed, you know, if someone was not doing the right thing, they got put under someone else um, for a period of time. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not arguing that that was the only way to handle it, that it was, you know, it might not even even be the way to handle it. But it for the people at the time in the place, as a provisional way of helping um, helping the Israelites understand their commitments to each other, um, I think that was its purpose and that's how it should be understood. So then the other thing that people often bring up is the killing of the Canaanites. Uh, when they come into the uh, they come into the promised land and God says wipe these people out. So um, how do we how do we think about that in terms of of God's goodness? Now, first of all, we need to keep keep in mind that God's commands were specifically about the Canaanites. God did not give this command for Israel to wipe out all of their enemies in this way. He didn't say, you know, anyone you don't like, get rid of them. It was specifically the Canaanites. Um, in fact, in other conflicts, God specifically said that the way that Israel should engage war is to first offer terms of peace. Okay, that's actually for anyone except the Canaanites, they were to first offer terms of peace. Um, so what is it that the Canaanites did? I should also note um, one thing that I didn't put on here is that God specifically said, don't think that I'm putting you here because you all are so righteous. He did not say that. He said this. He said it's because they're so evil, not because you're righteous. Okay, so what, what was it that the Canaanites did? I think that was Deuteronomy 9, if I remember. Um, so first of all, they engaged in child sacrifice. Um, they uh, they said that you know it made their sons and daughters pass through the fire. Well, that's that's what that is. That's child sacrifice. They were killing their kids and sacrificing them to these uh, uh, to the to these alleged gods. Uh, they engaged in sorcery and witchcraft. Um, they also engage in numerous sexual abominations. So if you ever read that list in Leviticus of all these sexual things you're not supposed to do, and you're like, who would have thought to do it? Well, at the end of that list, it says, this is the these are the practices of the people who were there in the land before you. So just recognize that those, those things are listed down because people were actually engaging in these practices as a matter of course. And that's the people that they displaced. Um, and the other thing is, this was not something that they had just started doing. 
Um, they had been sinning continually against God for 400 years. So God was not just like instantly angry. It wasn't just like they did something and God's like, I'm just going to wipe them all out. No, they'd been sinning against God for 400 years. Um, and, uh, the, you know, in Genesis 15, 16, God's talking to a- to uh, Abraham about the people. And he's like, they, they're, they're, these people are doing bad, but the they the fullness of, of what they're going to do has not yet come about. God gave them 400 years and they, they just kept on getting worse. Um, you know, many people say, why doesn't God stop evil? But in the cases where he does, they say, well, why is God so harsh? So that's kind of the, the, the thing to remember, you know, God, God didn't just immediately poof, prevent these people from doing evil. He didn't wipe them out as soon as it happened. He gave them time um, it was um, it was definitely a harsh judgment, but um, it was not unwarranted. So some general ideas um, I want you to take away from this section is, uh, you know, there's no, there's a lot of questions people have about the goodness of God in the Old Testament, um, and I'm not going to pretend like I'm gonna I have answers for every single thing that happened, um, but there's a lot of things that you should keep in mind. So um, first of all, we're oftentimes just looking at an isolated verse and not the whole picture. For example, in the case of the Canaanites, how many people actually go back to Genesis and look and see how long these people have actually been been sinning against God? Well, they usually don't. Um, so we usually are looking at little little pieces and not not looking at the whole picture. Um, we're oftentimes misapplying modern conceptions to ancient situations. Um, we're also often blind to our own moral ignorance and limitation. We think that we are the top and the pinnacle of moral excellence, and we don't recognize that there's actually probably something that we can learn where, where we might, when, when we're passing judgment on morality, where we're actually the ones who have the more limited view. And we should indeed expect God's justice to look different than we expect for the very reason that we're not God. We have a more limited uh, viewpoint. And so if we um, if we expect God to do everything just the way we want, then God is not being God. We are basically making God in our own image. Um, so, I mean, in, in whole, since we are made in the image of God, we should expect God to understand God's morality in general, but not necessarily in every specific case. Um, so kind of the way, the way that I, I think this works, especially with apologetics, is that when we recognize that the general outlines and the general uh, broad strokes of the Bible, when we realize that all those things are correct and line up, then we can trust the justice of the remaining ones that we don't comprehend. So if we can if if we can understand what God's doing in general, and we can understand the you know the the basics of 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 what He's doing, and and how these moral conceptions fit together, then you know there might there might still be areas we don't understand, and that's fine. We don't have to understand everything, but we should recognize that. You know, as we go through, as we recognize more and more of the times when we thought that there was a problem, that there wasn't really a problem, we can recognize that in the future, we're probably going to find more of those places where we thought there was a problem, and it turned out there wasn't actually a problem. The problem was with us, not with God. So, um, and then finally, the goal of the Old Testament law is not to provide an exact list of rules to obey to be a moral education on how to consider our roles, our duties, our responsibilities, and prohibitions in relationship to each other. Uh, the law is about how society can, um, they, they've got, it's got duties to each other, um, and we can use that as, under, as help for understanding. It's not, the goal of it isn't to say, oh, this was outlawed in the Old Testament, therefore we should outlaw it today, or, um, it's just to, to give us a, an understanding of what is right and wrong and how that and how what we do affects other people. Um, and then w- with regards to God's judgment, you know, we can recognize both God's patience and his judgment. God is patient. He waited 400 years, but God's not going to wait forever. And we can actually do this when we recognize injustice in the world, that we can see that 
you know, God does allow injustice to go on for a long time for the reasons that we said that, you know, if, if God just stopped it instantly, um, you know, there would be no such thing as moral and immoral behavior. It would prevent our ability for us to have an impact on our neighbor. But you know what? God eventually does come in and he does show up and he does uh, execute his judgment and his wisdom. Um, and, um, and, and he does step in. So we should not, we shouldn't be unaware of God's patience and we shouldn't be unaware of God's judgment.